Rakai. We are from Group 1. We are going to present on a book written by Angela Duckworth entitled Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. The members of our group are Najat, Muha, Haja, and me, myself, Hidayah. We are going to present on four things. The first one is introduction and meaning of grit. The second one is how to be an expert. The third one is purpose and hope in grit's philosophy. And the last one is parenting and grit. Hello everyone, my name is Nurul Hidayah Binti Rosi and I'm going to talk about introduction and meaning of grit. That you must once say, some people are great when things are going well, but they fall apart when things aren't. This quote is closely related to grit. Then, what is grit and why it matters? What is grit? The literal meaning of grit are courage and resolve. Grit is also defined as passion and perseverance, where goals are set and followed through. A person who works really hard to follow through on commitments has true grit. Then, why grit matters? Our potential is one thing. However, what we do with it is another question. We have always been distracted by talent to the point we forget that greatness are generated by effort. Grit is a combination of ability with exceptional zeal and the capacity for high level. As much as talent comes, effort comes twice. The book mentioned about Warren Buffett's three steps technique to achieve grit. The first one is write, the second one is circle, and the third one is avoid. First, write down a list of 25 career goals. Second, circle five highest priority goals. And the third one, avoid. Avoid 20 goals that you did not circle. These goals are called distraction. We go back to the first one. Right. When we write a list of 25 career goals, this is same like how we generate ideas in creative thinking. When we want to solve a problem, we will list out all the possible solutions or all the possible ideas for the problem, which is also known as the diverse thinking. The second one is circle. When we circle five highest priority goals, which means we narrow down our solution which is also known as converged thinking in creative thinking. Whenever we want to find a solution, whenever we already have several solutions, but we will have to choose which one is better, then we will use this way of thinking. The second technique mentioned in the book is level of goals. There are three levels of goals. The first one is low level, the second one is mid level, and the last one is top level. What is low level goal? Low level goal is the most concrete and specific goal. It is also the short term to do list and always a means to an end. As an example, I want to get out of house by 8 am. What is mid level goal? Mid level goal is concrete and specific goals, but still the short term to do list and still a means to an end. As an example, I want to arrive at work on time, whereas the top level goal is an end in itself, which is also known as the ultimate concern. Top level goal act as a compass that gives direction and meaning to all the goals below it. Top level goals may differ from one person to another person, but how we can recognize it as top level goal when this goal becomes the ultimate concern or the ultimate purpose in one's life. These are the hierarchy of goals. As you can see, at the top one is top level goal and mid level goals and the last one is low level goals. Low level goals and mid level goals always answer to top level goal. This is simple like how we learn about how how they are in creative thinking. In how how they are when we have a problem, first we have a problem, then we will ask ourselves, what can we do or how to solve this problem? Then we will find a step. We will ask ourselves again, how to exactly achieve this or how to exactly solve this problem? This is same like the hierarchy of goals. 
first, we have the top level goal. And in order to achieve this goal, we will ask ourselves what we need to do that bring us to the mid level goal. And still, we will ask ourselves what we have to do or what we have to give in order to achieve this goal. And that bring us to the low level goal. When we talk about passion and perseverance, we are also going to talk about talent versus effort. And when we talk about talent versus effort, we are going to talk about two types of person. The first one is natural and the second one is tribal. What is natural? Natural is a person that achieves success through innate ability. A person who exhibits talent attention, intrinsic gift, skills, and knowledge, which means a naturalist, a person that is born with talent, skill, and knowledge above others, whereas a striver is a person that achieves success through hard work. Usually, striver has high motivation and perseverance. In order to answer the question, talent versus effort, the book comes up with a formula. The first one is talent times effort equal to skill. Skill times effort equal to achievement. So, the book concludes that no matter how talented or talentless a person is, as long as that person would like to put effort and work for their goals, they can have anything in their life. So, like how skills can be achieved through effort, Creative thinking also can be attained through limitless exercise. In conclusion, the concept of greed is the concept of staying true to our commitments even when we are not comfortable. It is about working on something you care about so much that you are willing to stay loyal to it. It's doing what you love, but not just falling in love, it's about staying in love. That's all from me. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hi everyone. How are you guys doing? I hope you are in a good condition and always stay safe. Before that, my name is Nunuha Alia Binti Adnan, metric number 1719658. Before we move further, can I ask you a question? What is the definition of expert according to you? For me, expert is not just focused in big things or maybe in world-class skill, professional performance or maybe mega things. No, yes, I mean yes, they are also an expert. But for me, expert also means that someone is skillful in particular area. Someone is good in doing anything good. For example, you are good in ironing clothes, in folding clothes, in doing house chores, or maybe good in reading, good in makeup, good in playing game maybe. Yes, brother, sister, you are also an expert. Let's get back on track to our main part, which is how to be an expert according to Greed by Angela Duckworth. Hmm, there are three main ideas that lead us to be an expert, which are the first one is interest, and the second one is effort, while the third one is experience. Let's go deeper to our first main point, which is interest. Okay, what is interest means that you are doing what you love. Sometimes you don't know what your passion, so you have to make try and error. It means that you discover yourself what your passion and what's your interest. But once you got what you love, you found out that you are suitable at your interest, at what you are doing right now. So you have to improvise it day by day until you become an expert. Definitely, it is intrinsic motivation that you are discovering your talent, your passion, or your interest. Some of you may wondering, 
What about people that did something to satisfy their parents or family? For example, they, they are pursuing their study in the major that they didn't interested at but their father or maybe their parents ask them to proceed the study in the major, for example, engineering. Surprisingly, how can they survive? I said before that we must follow what you love. But you must remember that in your journey for you to discover new passion, sometimes you need the support from others from outside. For example, your family, your friends, your society for you to generate or discover your passion. In the middle of your journey, if you found out that you are not interested in what you are doing, so it's okay for you to take a step back and make a detour. It means that you are making try and error. It is not in a day or in a week for you to discover your passion. It needs maybe 10 years or maybe much much time for you to discover your passion. It's good for you to do what are you love at or maybe you love what you are doing. It, both of it is okay. For me, you can practice SWOT analysis in the middle of your journey to discover your interest. It means you are searching for your strength, searching for your weakness and opportunities and traits of what your interest will be. Let's move to the next point of how to be an expert, which is effort. Yes, effort is like creative. It means it's not an innate. And you have to put an effort to be an expert. I'm sure that you have you've heard this quote for many many times. No pain, no gain. For example, an athlete. They are doing what they love. They know what their in passion and interest. But the physical strength or maybe the physical look is not supporting them to be an expert. For example, Azizul Hasni Awang, a Malaysian cyclist. We know that Malaysian people are very small in size, but he proved that he can be a world champion after putting so much effort and he can beat all other cyclists and he did it. Yes, if you love what you are doing, but you are not doing anything, you don't put an effort for you to be, to develop your skill or develop your talent, it's not going to be anything. Angela Duckworth wrote in this book, not just nature, not just nature, both. And the last main point of how to be an expert is experience. We know that. People mature over time and there's so much disappointment, rejection, failure that we had experienced before. Every time we have to go through our bitter part, we have to leave our weakness and discover your weakness and try to give a solution for your weakness. For example, being student, how to be an expert in using PowerPoint or Filmora or Word, especially during ELTL. So, what you're going to do is we need to improve day by day. Our weakness will make us a step forward, not backward. Experience is a best teacher, right? For that reason, an expert usually is practicing deliberate practice. It means that they focus on weakness with specific goal, variety their challenges and not focus on what they have expert at, they are good at, but they focus on their weakness. For example, in sport, they have to improvise day by day and try to make many levels of training until they become an expert. And the last one, yes, for sure, you have to listen to the constructive feedback for you to be an expert, to improve yourself. For that reason, we can practice black thinking hack. 
you have to critique yourself what's your weakness what's your solution for it yes you have to critique yourself and do something not just focusing in one thing only so after you are good in that particular area you have to improvise it day by day and widen your area and that's all from me let's proceed to Najat Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh My name is Najat Azam Mithi Rashid and I will be continuing this presentation with the chapters that I have covered in the book called Grit by Angela Duckworth According to Grit's philosophy, there are four psychological assets that mature paragon of Grit's have in common and they tend to develop over the years in a particular order First comes interest and then it comes to the capacity of practice third is purpose and finally hope i will be explaining on the two last orders from these psychological assets so let's move on to the third order in these psychological assets which is purpose what is purpose in grid's philosophy purpose is the intention to contribute to the well-being of others. In other words, they are meaning something much deeper than their mere intention. They are not just goal-oriented or achieving goals for themselves. They do matters to people other than themselves too. By having these intentions to not only achieving goals for themselves, but to help benefiting others too, will shape them to be a greater person over time. There are two different orientations can be seen in purpose according to Grit's philosophy. The first orientation is self-orientation and other orientation. What are these two different orientations? So, the first orientation is self-orientation. What is a self-oriented person? A self-oriented person is a person who is concerned primarily with oneself, especially with one's desires, needs, and interests. This orientation only focuses on themselves, on self-growth, and nothing related to the external. Everything are made for themselves. Actions and intentions are contributed to them and doesn't benefit anyone but themselves rather than other orientation other oriented person or a person who are aware of the thoughts needs goals and desires of their communicating partner while still maintaining their own integrity this orientation is similar to the purpose according to grid's philosophy that i have explained earlier and they do not just benefiting themselves, but also to benefit other people around them too. So, how can I relate these two different orientations with creative thinking? I can conclude that self-orientation can be related to convergent thinking because they only focuses on oneself, which is similar to convergent thinking, which only focuses on one solution to a single problem. Rather than other orientation, I can conclude that other orientation can be related to divergent thinking because they are aware and care about other people too. Similar to divergent thinking, which we come up with a lot of solution to a single problem. Let's move on to the last order in psychological assets, which is hope. What is hope in Grid's philosophy? Hope is an expectation that our own efforts can improve our future. Hope that a Grid person have has nothing to do with luck, but everything to do with getting up again, having efforts to ensure our hope comes true. So, in this chapter, there are ways to assess people's theory of intelligence by asking them four different statements. 
These statements are as below. The first statement is, your intelligence is something very basic that you can't change much. Second, you can learn new things, but you can't change how intelligent you are. The third statement, no matter how much intelligence you have, you can always change it. And the last statement, you can always substantially change how intelligent you are. Which statements do you agree to? There are two types of person that we can identify from these four statements. If you agree to the first and the second statement, then you are a pessimist person. But if you agree to the third and the fourth statement, then you are an optimist person. What are these types of person means? If you agree to the first and the second statement, then you are a pessimist. What is a pessimist? They are people who is inclined to be hopeful and to expect poor outcomes. These people are tend to expect the worst of things and to believe that worst things will happen. They are more likely to have depression and anxiety. They often say things like, I am a loser, I can't do this anymore. And these things, you can't change nothing about it, so it stays in your mind. Basically, a pessimist have an inner fixed mindset. If you agree to the third and the fourth statement, then you are an optimist. What is an optimist? They are a person who is inclined to be hopeful and to expect good outcomes. These people are tend to be confident about their future or the success of something. Optimists are tend to be healthier throughout middle age and to live longer than pessimists. They often said things like, oh, maybe I didn't work efficiently because of distractions. The explanation is specific and temporary, so it motivates them to clear them all up as problems. Basically, an optimist have an inner growth mindset. Okay guys, so how can I relate these two different types of person with creative thinking and their relevances? I can conclude that a fixed mindset of pessimist can be related to convergent thinking because they only see life in a single perspective and no one can change the thought of what's coming so it gives a negativity to the mind. Rather than a growth mindset of an optimist, I can surely relate this to a divergent thinking because they see life in a bigger picture which boosts up confidence and positivity to their mentality. In conclusion, I found that creativity starts with an open mind and a growth mindset. It is very important to have this kind of mindset to have a creative thinking. It is best if you master all these orientations and to be optimistic to ensure that we be a mature, greedy person in the future. Thank you guys for watching and let's continue with my friend Haja for the next presentation. Hello and Assalamualaikum everyone. My name is Tuan Siti Hajar binti Tuan Muhammad Johari, metric number 1715236. Alright, so now we move to the next topic of the book which is Parenting for Great. The writer shared about two interesting stories of two people, Steve Young and Francisca Martinez. Steve Young lived with a very strict and tough father, while Francisca Martinez's parents are more relaxed and easygoing. So, from here, we can see two different styles of parenting. Hmm. Which one is the best parenting? What's your opinion? Through this video, I will help you to identify which is the best parenting style. But first, let me show you an overview of parenting category. It consists of four quadrants which are the permissive parenting, the wise parenting, the neglectful parenting, and the authoritarian parenting. As we can see here, the wise parenting is the best parenting category because the parents demand from the kids for their 
life goals and plans for the future. But at the same time, the families also motivate the kids throughout the journey. Furthermore, let's delve deeper into the reason why wise parenting is the best parenting category. What is wise parenting category based on the six thinking hats? Actually, the parents use all the thinking hats in order to interact with their children. White hats is used when the father and mother focus on the kid's life goals and plans. The parents also use the red hat when they care about the kid's feelings, emotions, and mental health state. They put the yellow hats while keep being optimistic towards the kids and always motivate them. They also use green hats in order to be more creative with the new ideas and how to approach the kids. They also use the blue hats in order to organize and ensure themselves to react accordingly to the situation of the kids. And last one, they also use the black hats in order to be aware of any negative feedbacks from the kids and be cautious. So, how can other quadrant is in perfect category? First, permissive parenting. The parents here only put yellow hats by being positive in their kids' choice. The parents support whatever the kids want without putting any boundaries and demand. The second one is authoritarian parenting. The parents only put a white hat focusing on the kids' goal to fulfill their dreams and demand without taking care of the kids' condition and ability. They do not even give motivation to the kids. And the last one, which is I guess the worst one is the neglectful parenting. The parents do not even bother about the kids. They neither plan for the kids' future nor helping them surviving their current life. Now, let's dig into Benjamin Bloom's study on wise parenting. First, wise parenting is the model of ethics in that they were regarded as a hard worker. Two, parents in wise parenting believe that work should come before play and one should work towards distant goals. Three, it is natural to encourage the kids to participate in their favorite activities. And the last one is, become a creative and critical thinking parents in order to motivate and support the children. Hmm, the last point is quite interesting. It made me realize how important for a parent to have a creative and critical thinking skills. Here, we need to apply the skill that we have learned in our class UNGS 2011. Let me show you one of the situation of the mom solving the kids problem using concept of fan. So, this is a situation as an example in order to show how can the parents be creative in finding solution using the concept fan. The first step is Acknowledge or identify the problem and started to find some possible solution. So that's how Siti did the first step. Second one, she now realized that the first ideas generated are quite impractical. So she takes a step back for a broader view of the problem. Next, from there, she uses it as the starting point to start to radiate new ideas to motivate Ahmad. Then, from the technique of taking a step back to get a broader perspective, Siti now has achieved the new ways of solving Ahmad's problem. So, here is the result. Now you know how hard it is to be a parent. But, I come of thinking. Does parenting for great only applies to the parents? Hmm, I don't think so. The word parenting itself derives from Latin, means to bring forth. So actually, all of us are parents to young people other than our own children in the sense that collectively, we are responsible 
for bringing forth the next generation. So, apart from father or mother, teacher and appointed person also can be the parents in someone's life. So, what can we conclude here is, we actually don't need to be a parent to make difference in someone's life. If we just care about them and get to know what's going on, we can make an impact, try to understand what's going on in their life and help them through that. I think that's all for me. Thank you.